pizza, but I want to have everybody, well, you got your names, name tags out, which I love. Um, how many of you guys, how long have you been in business? Uh, you're 19, right? So I know you're not been in very long. Congratulations, by the way, that's very fun. So, um, so pretty great, pretty brand new, correct? Right? I just got my license in May. So okay. Yeah. So I got my license a couple weeks ago. Or it's been like three weeks now. Okay. That's good. Uh, a year. Okay. Uh, I got my like two and a half years. I just recently left my corporate job, so I'm focused on that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let's open it. Thank you. I just want to give the interns some questions. <laughs> um, so let me ask. How many, well, let me introduce myself, I guess, first. You probably know, but um, I'm Mark Kuchik with Cross Country Mortgage. Um, our office, so I've got an office here uh, at the end of the hallway. And I'm generally here Tuesday, and Thursday, I'm sorry, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays. However, that's physically here. However, I'm always, we're always available. Um, we even have weekend coverage, um, things like that, knowing that you guys are gonna be out in the field with the clients and so forth. Um, Cross country mortgage. Anybody hear of our before? Okay. Nope. Okay. The reason I bring it up is a lot of a lot of people who um, are just getting into real estate. A lot of people don't hear our name as much as some of the other companies, and that's by design in the sense that we don't advertise. I mean, our company does a little bit regionally. We're a national company based out of Cleveland, Ohio. We're considered the third largest retail lender in the whole country. So that tells you we we do a lot a lot of business. It's just our local business model is more based on referrals. We don't have to advertise. And so that's why you probably, some of you haven't heard our name, but how many of you guys have owned a home before? Okay, mostly, okay. So let me ask you, what was your experience, Tony, going through the mortgage process of buying? Um, I had a pretty smooth trend or uh, process. I think that, uh, I think my, I had a loan officer who dealt with me pretty well. Um, he was pretty quick on a lot of yeah. things and things like that. So yeah, yeah, I think it was pretty good. Okay, anybody else want to share? Mine wasn't very pleasant. I had a VA loan and so I had like some serious stipulations we had to go through and mm -hmm. a bunch of people who really couldn't do it. And one guy said, I can do it in two days before closing. We found out it was approved, which we ended up and then rented for two months, and we get but yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah, we worked it out, but it, it's a lot. I got a call Friday. Um, client was pre approved with the bank, and they're under contract closing on July 31st. Just found out Friday morning they can't get the loan approved, mm -hmm. and they got a pre approval letter from that same bank that then said something changed. And so, one of the things that I, I will tell you is, um, 64%, the stat is 64% or 62% of people going through the mortgage process have a bad experience. It's either what you described, um, it's poor communication, lack of communication, not knowing where you're at in the process. But that's, think about that, that's more than half of your clients are gonna go through a frustrating process, right? And one of the things that you're gonna find that you, <clears throat> as you especially build confidence in, in growing as a realtor is you're going to be able to control the transaction much, much more um, than you may think you can. And so if you look at a lot of the top producers, they all have a go-to lender that they trust, right? Because what they don't, what they recognize is they can't have what, what Jessica have happened, right? I, and the other part of what I was going to tell you is Friday, I had that client I got, I'm getting him approved right now. Um, so that, that other company dropped the ball. And these people were ready literally to walk away. They said, maybe I should, maybe it's uh, the sign that I should, I should buy, right? And so all it was was just a, a, a mediocre loan officer who did not do his job properly. Anybody who gives a pre-approval letter and then later says there's an issue, that's because the loan officer did not do his due diligence. Um, in this case here, I don't know why it went sideways, but I came in and did something that he had the ability to do. He just didn't know how to do it. And that comes with 30 years of experience that I have. Um, our company is very, very uh, common sense oriented as far as how we underwrite 
loans. And I'll get in a little bit about what, what I mean by that. Because um, not every lender is equal. Um, some lenders have additional guidelines or what we call overlays. Uh, overlays are <clears throat> additional guidelines above normal guidelines. So for example, what does anybody know what the minimum credit score is for an FHA loan? 640. 640. 640. Okay. In a way, you're both right. The real answer is 500. It's pretty darn low score, right? <laughs> Why I say you're in a way right is mortgage companies will put on top of the normal guidelines. So FHA's guideline is 500 minimum credit score, but then individual mortgage companies will then put overlays or additional guidelines on top of the normal guidelines. And so you're, you know, one company might be a 640 credit score. Another one might be 620. A lot of them are at 580. Okay. Now we are, we still follow the 500. We don't have that overlay. Um, I will say if you're below a 580 credit score, it's very, very difficult to get approved, but it's possible, right? But the other thing on top of that is, you know, you might have three lenders that you talk to and they all say, yeah, our minimum credit score is 580 for FHA. But if you ask more questions, they'll tell you if you have a 580, you have to have 10% down payment when the, the normal down payment is only three and a half percent of the sales price. So they make you put 10% down and you have to have six months of reserve assets in your bank account so that if something goes sideways, you have emergency funds to make your mortgage payment. Well, generally speaking, if you have a 580 credit score, you probably don't have 10% down and you don't have those additional reserves, right? So they go to 580, but nobody qualifies. We, we don't have all these extra hoops, okay? That's the difference. We're not the only lender that doesn't have those extra hoops, but that just gives you a flavor of not every lender is equal. Okay. Um, so kind of going back to what I talked about as far as, um, you know, you look at top producing realtors, they do control the transaction. They do have their go-to lender. They have their go-to for everything, right? Because they don't want to, you know, um, if you talk to some of your mentors, um, and, and, you know, just talk to them about their business and, you know, deals going south, mortgage companies messing up, things like that. That does affect your referability because you guys are going to find it's, it's you're going to work your tails off to get new deals in the door. And <clears throat> most of you are going to work primarily by referral only. You might, you're going to market a lot to your, your sphere and all that, but I doubt that many of you are going to truly advertise, right? So word of mouth referrals is huge. And if you have a client who has a bad mortgage experience, even if they went to, they came in and said, oh, I'm already pre-approved at my bank, and they have this bad mortgage experience, they're going to walk away with a bad taste in their mouth, right? And you guys could have done a phenomenal job for that person, but all they remember is that crappy lender, that bad experience. Um, I had to rent for two, was, was it two and a half months or two and a half years? Two and a half months. Two and a half months, right? Like that's, that's horrible, right? And that's, you, I mean, arguably you may not even remember your realtor, how great they did for you because you're, you're the only you remember is that PSTP from the lender, right? And so that's where you guys want to recognize that your clients truly do look to you as their trusted advisor. No different, arguably no different than they do their doctor, their lawyer, their CPA, their financial advisor. Right in their eyes, that's how they see you. You're their, their real estate expert. Problem I see with a lot of realtors, especially newer ones, is they don't see themselves as that advisor. And our, you know, we didn't go to school for. I didn't go to school to be a mortgage guy. You didn't go to school to be, a, you know, like the attorney went to school to be an attorney. The CPA got, you know, what I mean. So you've got to, you've got to get your brain, you know, believing that you are their real estate advisor and. They, they're looking to you for their help, for your help, I should say. And when somebody says, I already got a pre-approval with this bank, you know, I'm not going to tell you, just like, most of the top people will say, I thank you for sharing that with me. That's great. Here's what I would like for you to do is get a second opinion with my guy that I've worked with, blah, blah, blah. Because your job is going to be that much easier if you're in a rhythm with that lender um, it's less time you're going to spend babysitting the, the mortgage guy. It's the more time you spend over here babysitting the mortgage guy, the less time you're spending on prospecting. Just a fact. 
and I talked to many realtors who say they average about two or three hours a week following up on, on loans. And that takes away from family time and their prospect. Okay. So just think about that. Um, who the lender is can make all the difference in the world of getting your offer accepted. If you're a buyer in this type of market, it's competitive, and you're one of 10 offers coming in or even one of five, a lot of times it comes down to final two or three, right? And they're, they're, they're very close in what price is being offered. Everything looks about the same. So how does the seller pick? It's the lenders a lot of times, right? And if it's not a safe lender, um, they would rather pass on that offer because they don't know who that lender is. There's no accountability with that lender. Um, they focus on local because there is accountability. If I screw a deal up, the sole office is going to hear about it pretty much. And then my, I have a lot more to risk, right? Because I will burn a lot of relationships here versus if I was working with a big bank out of state and I had one of your buyers, if I blow a closing, I don't really care. I'm not going to talk to you ever again in my life. Right. And that's, I hate to say it, that's kind of the mentality a lot of uh, lenders have. Realtors know that, sellers know that. So when it's all equal, they want low reputable people. Right. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And the second opinion, too, I, I got in here. There's there's quite a few things in this packet I'll, I'll share with you. So I'm not going to go through a lot of this with you, but on the left side, I've got um, mortgage and lending terms. So it's 40 pages of any term you can imagine, any word, it's going to give you a pretty precise um, definition of what that is, okay? One of the things I put on top is a great introduction. If you were happy, if you got in a position where you were um, working with a buyer, you were not confident in their lender, you thought it might be an out-of-state situation where it's not going to be good. Getting a second opinion, this, this is a great uh, little marketing piece that I put together for clients. And I'd say seven, seven, seven out of 10 of my clients truly have already been pre-approved with another lender. They get the second opinion with me and they choose to work with us. Um, and that's because we are a little different than most lenders. And I'll just give you a brief synopsis on this. But most lenders today have used, fill out the application online. They quickly work out the pre-approval letter and they send it right away. And it looks very great because it's fast, right? And a lot of times we'll just say, hey, let me know if you have any questions. And your clients are sitting there going, wish I even knew what questions to ask, right? Or even if you've owned a home before. Um, I had a first time home buyer, he did just that. He, he actually uh, got pre approved. Um, his realtor finally, because he was out two weeks looking at homes, recognized that he something was missing there. So he had him talk to me. I met with him in person. And that's, that's where I was going with this is we don't shortcut the process. We, we sit down with your clients, we um, go through their goals, what's important to them. Um, so many people get into the wrong loan program. Um, you know, one of the questions uh, I always ask clients and realtors is what's, uh, for, for, what's the best loan program for a first time home buyer? Anybody have a guess? That's a good situation. Good job. No? Thank you for making my point. Okay, I, of, I hear a lot of people say that. And that's yeah, and that's that's and, and even parents are guiding their children to go FHA because mm -hmm. it's their first home, and everybody thinks it's the best first time home buyer program. One, you don't have to be a first time home buyer to go FHA. Two, it is what's best for their situation. Um, FHA historically has been if your credit score is below seven hundred, you would be better off to go FHA. They've redone a few things, um, how they uh, charge for their monthly mortgage insurance premiums. It is a little more attractive today, but I would say if you're below, depends on your income level now, too. It's a little complex on which one is better. Um, but, you know, before they made all the changes, um, if you had a top tier credit score and you bought a $200,000 home, going FHA would have cost that buyer $46,000 more over the life of the loan, $46,000 more. That's that's like irresponsible lending, right? But unfortunately, lenders are more order takers than anything. Um, well, side note, government loans like FHA are bigger money makers for lenders, so they welcome people wanting to go that route. But a lot of times what it is, it's um, lenders are more order takers. So they just, you know, whatever the client asks for, they give them, right? And I did have a, a gal come to me, um, 
get a second opinion from her realtor. And when she called me up, she was young, um, 23 or four years old. And it was her first home. And she was very confident in herself. She said, what, um, what is your interest rate on the, the um, 30 year fixed FHA loan today? And when I get that question, I know right away, this person has no idea what they're doing and they don't know what else to ask except for that, right? So I explained how we do our business a little different. Um, you know, we do take the time to meet with you. So I had her make the application. She actually came in and met with me face to face, which I prefer if they can't do that or it's not convenient, we'll do it by Zoom. Uh, but I like, I love the interaction because if your clients do not understand financing and they don't have the confidence or clarity of financing, they're gonna drag their feet. Dragging their feet means in some way, and I've heard realtors say, oh gosh, he's so picky. I've shown him 30 homes. He's not picky. He's sitting there going, am I making the right decision or am I um, chewing off more than I can handle? Like the, all this stuff is going on in their head, right? Financially. So I take the time to meet with them. I met with this girl. I went through uh, her goals, what's important to her. I even love asking, what is your biggest concern going through this process, right? Because even if you've owned a home before, you go through it today, you still have concerns of some, some sort, right? And if nobody's asking that question and dispelling it because every concern I've ever heard when I ask the question either does not apply to that person or it's flat out wrong information they heard from somebody. But if they don't, anybody doesn't really go through that with them, it just lingers and it just, it, it's that, you're just dragging their feet. So I showed this gal the FHA program and I asked her when, after I showed her why that was important to her. And she said, well, Mark, I don't have a lot of money to put down. So that's why I went to go FHA. FHA is a down payment of three and a half percent. So I showed her the conventional loan option, which is 3%. So her goal was to put less money down. Well, my, my program is much, uh, well, it's a little bit less, right, out of pocket. But the kicker was FHA has what's called an upfront mortgage insurance premium. For her situation, it's like $3,700. She did not have to pay that on the conventional loan. So I just saved her $3,700. And her monthly mortgage payment was $56 less per month. And she just sat there and looked at me. And I mean, she was so excited. I thought she was going to go to the table and hug me. <laughs> she asked me, why did my bank show me this? And I cannot answer that, right? Other than you were very confident in your request to me, what is your 30-year fixed FHA rate? And I'm not an order taker. I'm a consultant. And I, I slowed down the process purposely and did that meeting so that she did not get her financial. A lot of other people just do it online and they kick out these letters and they get, put people in the wrong product or they screw it up and then they did, you know, then they, they, you get told you can't close, right? So we just, we just do that for, for many reasons. Um, I personally believe our approach of doing the consultations helps you convert your clients quicker. So this other kid that I was getting ready to start with, he was out looking. He, his realtor gave him two cards, which, by the way, that is, um, some people say three cards. That is not a rule. That is not a law. That's not a regulation. That is just a best practices so that if um, something goes sideways, you, you're, you, you can say, well, I gave you three names, right? Again, I go back to your, um, your top producers and ask them what they do. Most of them don't do that. They find somebody they trust. Um, and once they trust somebody, you know that's not going to go south, right? Um, but anyway, this guy happened to randomly call the other guy first. And then um, the realtor said, hey, just call Mark. It was after like two weeks. So I sat down, did the whole consultation with him. And literally, um, you know, I was asking him, was this helpful? Did, you know, blah, blah, blah. He was a skin shaking my hand so excited. He goes, Mark, I've been driving around with my realtor for two weeks. I didn't even know what my payment was going And you could hear as he's saying, he was getting a little disgusted because he, he felt like the guy was kind of screwing him in a way, right? And so that's the guy that was out looking for two weeks and didn't want to do anything, right? Another version of, of, of not having financial clarity is they do make offers, but they're not strong enough offers. They keep missing out, they keep missing out, they keep missing out, right? Because they don't want to accept the market for what it is, they, they right? Because financially, they're, they're just not prepared, right? And you guys, I know every single one of you, when you sit down with a buyer, you are going to go through market conditions and this is um, what to expect. You may have to bid a little bit more than the list price. You may have to do what's called an appraisal gap, all these things, right? When you are the one saying that to your buyer, 
some of them in the back of your mind go, yeah, of course you do um, want me to pay more, right? Because you get paid if I buy the house, right? They won't say it to you, but they kind of think that sometimes, right? Um, that's another thing that I like to do in my consultations is really go through the market conditions and prepare them for you know, what to expect. And a lot of it's reiterating what you guys have already said to them, but they see me as a neutral person. And I don't have a best of interest. I do, but they don't see it that way, right? And so I'm validating what you guys are saying to them. But I also have permission to have deeper conversations because I'm in their finances. I see everything, right? And so I can talk about appraisal gaps and, and, and all that. I've got some tools that <clears throat> could be another day that I could share this with you guys. But, um, you know, when you go through um, concerns, let's say, you know, I do ask the concerns, you know, some people will say, well, I guess let me ask here from you guys, what, what are some of the concerns that you've already experienced or objections for people, you know, especially buyers, um, you know, what's their hesitancy or what's, what are you hearing that's causing them a little concern? One of the biggest things I hear from just people that I know is the interest rates are crazy. Kind of about to seven, 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 eight, eight. Aren't they ridiculous? They're just going crazy. Yeah. Are they ridiculous today or were they ridiculous? Yeah. <laughs> right? They were ridiculously low. Yeah. And that's the, the message. So that's a good one. Okay. People concerned about being punished for good credit. Yeah. Isn't that what we do now? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, Seems like it. Yeah. well, and I would ask, I know, I think I know, or I can, can guess what, but is there any more information on that? Like specifically how they feel or what they're thinking? Um, they're just concerned that they're going to pay a lot more and, um, that they're going to have these like astronomical rates and, you know, okay. somebody at their bank will get XYZ and so it's like, well, talk to somebody else, you know, but yeah. Just not educated on what that program actually is, but there's other options out there. So lack of choices, I guess. So there was um, earlier in the year um, the HFA came out. That's a, a, a regulator of our industry. They came out and they adjusted these what we call loan level pricing adjustments. So people who had less money down and lower credit scores had an improvement to their interest rates and people have high credit scores, maybe a little bit more down, had to pay a little bit more for their rate. And so it got just this big, you know, a big deal. A lot of people got bent out of shape. I have not heard anybody talk about that anymore. It kind of came and went. Um, in the end, there's not, and there really wasn't that much of a difference either way. It was very, very minimal. I think it was just more of the principle of the matter that got people riled up. But that that I, I I just share them with them like their example. I can go back to what the old version was today for that particular person, and I can tell them what the difference is. And most of the time, we, we rarely get into the conversations. It's, they don't bring it up, but if we did a couple of times. I did. It's like, oh, that's not as bad as the shot because the media kind of hyped it up a little bit. Is that and that's only on certain loans? Then? It's just conventional loans okay. where that took place. Yeah, yeah. Um, and back to you, what was your um. Is the interest rates being oh high. yeah interest rates being high well so we are expecting to see mortgage rates drop at some point um we saw actually um, rates hit the highest level for this year last thursday so perfect time to get in real estate um, <laughs> but we already saw a little improvement friday a little improvement today we're expecting to continue to see improvement it's going to be up and down but the overall probably the next six to 12 months we should start to see rates go back under six percent and at that point, that's certainly going to bring more buyers in, right? So that's, again, another example of what I have is something called cost of waiting. So when somebody says, well, maybe I, I don't like these rates. I heard they're going to drop. Maybe I'll just wait, right? So I plug in their price point they're looking at, what they tell me they're putting down. And then I put in today's rate, and I even put in six months from now. Let's say rates did drop to six or even a year from now, right? And I can show them on paper that... Either if they if they do wait, it's going to cost them because home values are going which way? Yeah. Up, right? They're not going up like skyrocketing up like they did for three straight years, but they're still going up. The, I think the forecast for our local market is like four or five percent this year, right? Which is still double what it normally is. So it's still a great investment for people. I argue in Hampton County, we might not be a little bit more than that in certain you know, pockets and whatnot, but. This uh, cost of waiting illustration basically shows them that if they wait six months, 
that $300,000 home is now going to be 308, right? Or whatever it is. Um, and wait a full year, it's going to be um, 315. Even if rates drop one year from now to 6%, they lost out on, they paid, you know, $18,000 more from the house. So they lost 18 grand. They're, um, they do get a lower payment here, but they also lost out on how many months of, of principal reduction if they took a loan out. So if you're looking at renting right now, um, the interest rate on rent is 100%, right? Everything that you pay for rent goes to the landlord. There's no principal reduction, which is the beauty of homeownership. You take out a loan and every month, like on your car, you get you keep dropping the principal down, right? Well, that they would have lost that amortization as well. So they lost out on the appreciation, the home value going up, as well as the principal reduction on their loan. And yeah, they got a lower payment, but again, the numbers always show that it's going to be um, better to buy today at a higher interest rate versus waiting, right? Plus, not to mention, if you think rates, which they will, go under 6%, what do you think is going to happen? You can get a flood of buyers, right? More people buying, it's going to shoot the prices up even more. Yeah. So again, these are the things that I slow down the process for your buyers. I spend 30 to 40 minutes with them on, on in person or on Zoom to talk through these things so that they're prepared, right? Does it make sense to pay 310 on a home that is only worth 300,000? You guys might suggest that they pay 310 if they really want it, because that's what it's going to take, right? Does it make sense to do that? I, ask, I do ask your buyers that, right? And I, most of the time they say, yeah, I think it does, which is a good sign, right? But I validate why it's okay because um, home values are going to continue to go up. And I told them, if you buy a $300,000 home today and um, home values go up 5% in the next um, one year, that $300,000 home is worth $315,000. So if you paid three ten dollars for it today, did you get hurt? And they all say no, right? So I'm getting their brain around the fact that they may have to go out of their comfort zone. They may have to do something that doesn't seem logical, but it is, if they want to buy a home, you, I mean, and I always defer back to you guys. I always explain, you guys are the expert negotiators and whatever you guys advise, I'm just preparing them for that conversation. So if they're not ready for it, they're, they're the people that are out looking at homes and not pulling the trigger or they are pulling, they're writing an offer. It's just simply not strong enough, right? And there'll be a period of time if you end up having one buyer who loses out, say four or five, six homes, they are gonna question you. Am I working with the right person, right? Again, they won't say that out loud, but that's in their head, right? Or worse, you know, you've probably heard this, um, we're just gonna rent for a year. We just decided we're just gonna um, wait. And I've heard too many realtors tell me that. And then the realtor says, so we're just gonna call them next year. I'm like, wow, one, you're in sales, right? Two, how, sh we're on camera. <laughs> how bad, I say shame on you, that's what you do. Because that poor kid or that poor person, whoever it is, <clears throat> waits a full year and that $300,000 home now costs him 320 because he had nobody in his life guiding him. They just thought, oh, this is the best thing for me. That's to me, that's bad, right? And so point is, we have the resources, we have the data. Data does not lie. I can, I can preach all day long. You guys can preach all day long. You should buy today, blah, blah, blah. But when they see the data, it just like they can't argue, right? And and everything that I put together is based on hypotheticals, but it, I always err on the conservative side, so it's not over promising anything. Um, any questions on that? Add another thought. Yeah, I forgot. Okay, so objections are a big deal, and I have heard them all. I have data that shows everybody. Um, you know, why it's a good time to buy. And not for everybody. There are certain situations where it's best just to take a break or sit. But most of the time, once I give them the data, they're ready to go. There used to be a joke in my office when somebody would come in um, and say, I'm going to wait to buy, maybe until um, the fall or the spring. Um, that's like me going to the car dealership looking for cars, and they ask me if I can, if they can help me. And I said, no, no, I'm just kind of like, I'm there to buy a car. I just don't want anybody to mess with me, right? Because I don't want to feel pressured or sold. And a lot of your buyers, that's their way of saying, no, I'm just looking. Uh, well, we're probably going to wait until, right? So 
one thing I will say, if you ever hear that, it's absolutely never too early to talk to the right lender because even if they do wait till spring, all the information I'm going to provide to them is going to help them make better decisions. Okay. A lot of people procrastinate because they think they have to work on their credit when they don't. That's a fact. They think they need to save more down, more money down, and they don't. There's there's three percent down options, right? Has anybody heard of PMI, mortgage insurance? Scale of one to ten, how good is it? It's horrible. That's what people think. It's absolutely horrible, and yet. They don't even know what it is, right? Number one, they don't even know why they pay it, what it is, how much is it. They just were told, don't do it. Put 20% down. <clears throat> so one of my favorite things to do is when I have a client, I can tell they, you know, they want to put as much money down, um, whether it's 20% or not. But we have conversations around what would it look like if instead of putting 20% down, what if you only put five or I'm sorry, 15% down or 10% down, right? I've had like recently I had a guy, he's like, Mark, trust me, we don't want to do that. I said, Well, I understand, but I'm a big believer in explaining and exposing options. Just so you know, because most people don't know what options are available. And it's just so you make better decisions. And so I show them, and it's for certain uh, clients, right? People have decent credit or really good credit, their PMI is very low. If you have really, really low credit scores, that's different, right? We may not have that same conversation, but most clients we talk to do have pretty decent credit. And so the last guy I talked to him, instead of putting 20% down, we talked about 15% down, which is gonna put $20,000 back in his pocket. And he, because he told me 20 is gonna deplete everything. You just hear it's like, He'll do it, but he, it wasn't going to make him feel great, right? So we put 20 grand back in his pocket. Trade off is he had to pay PMI. For his situation, the PMI was like 28 or $32 a month, and he paid it for like three years. So I did the math. He was only going to pay like twelve or $1,300 in PMI. And it was just like a lot of people, they go, oh, oh, that's it, right? And that's the route we proceeded on. But again, he would have gone a different direction if he didn't have somebody consulting him, right? So... Yeah, that's just another example of how we get people motivated and ready to go quicker. Now, if they don't want to start the process um, today, that's totally fine. Nobody has to like, um, I've had a lot of people recently that I'm just doing calls with, right? And I just talk to them about their situation, ask them the same similar questions, but I don't have a loan application. I don't have their credit pulled or anything. Um, and most of those people, well, every single one of them, I can tell you, is very appreciative um, because they feel better. You can almost hear sometimes the relief coming off. Most of the time, though, the numbers are better than expected. The process seems to be a little easier than I thought, and they, they're ready to go. And so, again, that's just, again, my, my, my goal is to help you guys make more money, help make your life easier, and then make you look damn good with your clients, right? And so everything we do is based on that, and the consultation piece is so powerful. So I'll just stop right there so you guys have any questions. So at what point, I guess, uh, is it the initial conversation that you have with a prospective client that you would want to get them like free for with you guys? Um, is that when you guys typically would like to see people who are possible clients? I'll be honest, anybody who has any thoughts of eventually buying a home, introduce them to us. Okay. Um, because most people are going to procrastinate. It's not a process yeah. that anybody's looking forward to doing. Um, if you've gone through it before, it's like, well, shit, I didn't want to go through it when I bought my last house. But your first time home buyers out of fear will just drag their feet, right? And so, you know, perfect world, like just with, like when you guys get a referral, you would want permission to contact that client to introduce yourself, right? Versus, oh, I passed your name on. You're going to hear that a lot in your career. And I'm going to tell you, half of those people never call you. Right. So you think you got to leave, but you really don't. Right. And it's because that person doesn't necessarily always know how to refer you. Um, and the people just don't, they, they're, they're just nervous and scared. And they heard this from their parents or they heard this from the guy at work. And now's not the time to buy. So they don't do anything. Right. Versus if you let us reach out to your buyer, I'm going to, there's no part of us that are pushing salespeople at all. I, and I say us, me and my team. 
we lead by with uh, hand, uh, handing out uh, information and education and, and making people feel good. So generally what we do is we just reach out and say, um, hey, Mr. Smith, um, Kayla had um, asked me to reach out to you at Mark with Cross Country Mortgage. Kayla asked me to reach out to you just simply to see if I could answer any mortgage related questions. That's all I said. And guess what happens? They tell me their whole story, where they're at. Well, it just like it just start sometimes throwing up on you, right? <laughs> so they have concerns. We talk through a little bit. Um, they may not be ready to get pre-approved, but they definitely feel better. But most people then are ready to go, right? Well, I didn't want my credit full. So we talk through that. That's another big misconception. Oh, it's horrible. You're gonna like you lose three or five or six points when credit is pulled. Okay. Um, that is nothing, and you get most of those back in 90 days. So that's that's a huge overblown thing. And if you really are serious about buying a home, that's just the fact you have to do it, right? Now, side note, I have the ability to pull a soft credit pull. So when I pull their credit, it does not show up as an inquiry, so it doesn't hurt their score. So that actually makes it feel better. But um, most people, I go through that, they're ready to go. And honestly, after the, that call, me reaching out to them versus me waiting for them to call, most people are so thankful and you can honestly hear the sincerity in their voice that I think I've heard it many times like, I was, oh, I've been wanting to call. Thank you for reaching out. I've been wanting to call you. And if you, I could just hear like they just wanted to, but they were scared, right? And so it's just, again, my job is to help you guys convert your leads. And that's just, again, how we do it. I'm never going to put anybody in an uncomfortable position. Um, when I make that call, when I do my consultations, I'm truly edifying you guys. I'm talking you up to your clients. Because a lot of your people you're still building trust with, right? And so they hear from me, kind of like that third party guy, it validates that they're working with the right people, right? So yeah, never too early. That's um is I'll reiterate it again. If you let that guy wait because he says he's gonna wait and then he ends up spending 20 grand more on that house, he's out on, right? He doesn't know it's on you, but I feel like it. it's on us, right? Our job is to guide them as trust advisors. All right. Getting pre approved early. I'll, I'll mention this. Do not fall in the trap of showing houses. Everybody's got a different philosophy. I've heard realtors say, well, I'll show one, but after that, then they have to get pre approved. Now, I've got other agents who say, I'm not going out there until you get pre approved. I need to know you're serious and qualified. And if you say yes to a non-qualified buyer, you're saying no to something else. And that no is sometimes your family, your prospecting times, things like that. And I can tell you, I had this, it was actually a Keller Williams agent way, way back in 2005 or six. Out of town buyers, two weekends in a row, same family. All day, Saturday, all day, Sunday, showed house the second week, came back, same, same thing. Sunday afternoon, they found one we're going to ride on. Get this guy's application credit, and I I called the real truck. I said, Mike, I'm sorry, it's not even close to ball. Not even close. I don't know how many homes he saw, but I'm telling you, it was jam packed for two straight days, two straight weekends. And this guy has five kids. He was gone two solid days. And I just thought, wow. And you, he's been in the business a very, very long time. He made the assumption this guy's coming in with a corporation that he's probably good, right? Oh, he's a doctor. Oh, he works for Lily. Oh, this. And guys, you're you you you, you got to protect your time, right? And think about it though, that family got kind of screwed too because they didn't know any better, right? And they spent how many how much time? Another related, there's not related, but a similar story is um, I had a another um, ironically another Keller Williams agent. I don't want to bring that up because we're sitting in Keller Williams, but um, I was in a, a, a coaching class in, in California. For two days and spent good money to get there. And um, I mean, while I'm there, I'm, I'm learning, right? And so, um, ate lunch, came up, run, brush my teeth, and go back to the class. My phone rings. And he says, Omar, we've got, a, I got a buyer. He needs to make an offer like right now. There's another offer on this home, and they have until 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. To, to accept it. So, I'm debating. I just spent $3,000 to go to this thing. Do I blow a class on? Or do I take care of my real estate partner? So I went to the class. No, I'm <laughs> no I, I, I blew the class off. I called the client, 
And they said, well, no, we're not going to buy a house yet. We have to sell our current home first. So I call the realtor up. I'm like, hey. he goes, all right, hang on. Let me call him. So he calls him. He goes, calls me back, says, okay, they're ready. So I call him back. I get their application, get them a pre approval letter. They get their offer accepted that day. I look like a hero. Fast forward two or three days later, they got their home inspection done and they used one little, it was not even something major. That was their out. They were done. They were not buying this house. Okay. And I forgot to mention an important part of this is when I'm talking to the realtor up front, he goes, Yeah, I've been working with these guys for six months, blah, blah, blah. It's like, how in the hell are you working with somebody for six months and they're not even pre approved? Like that, and he's in he's in real estate for a long time. His parents were both realtors. I'm thinking, how do you let that happen, right? And um, so anyway, the, the Wednesday, the whole deal blows up because these people had buyer's remorse. They got pushed into something they did not want to do, and it's because he didn't have them pre-approved, and you know, they just got rushed into something, right? So he lost them as a buyer and he lost the listing. He was going to list their house for sale. He lost two sales because he didn't get the people to the lender early. I had no idea why, right? So it's not about you guys wasting your time for an unqualified buyer or not. But think about that position that the realtor put that client in, right? And again, he lost money. He lost a relationship. He lost, you know, every deal that you did, every home you sell, with that client, if they're happy with you and you do stay in touch with them and, and, and stay in a relationship, they're probably going to buy three more homes from you, right? Or at least two more and refer you to somebody. So think about all the lost money, if you will, plus that client just got put in such a bad position. All right. So I'm going to ask, um, see if anybody has any questions. Do you help people that have bad credit? If they, like, do you have yeah, that's a great question. So the answer is yes. So when we pull credit, we have what's called a credit simulator. So some people, we can help them quickly bump their score up 20 or 30 points. So it's not a matter of them not qualifying today. It's that we can get them into a better interest rate or a better loan program. So we can do that. Or there's some people that just flat out, they don't qualify today. And so then we put a game plan together for them. So we're, we're very um, helping in that way. This, the credit simulator basically says the client can perform, if they perform these actions, their credit score could go to this. And it tells us very specifically what they can do. Um, it's, it's pretty accurate. It's usually 90 to 95% accurate if they do exactly that. So we're very much going to give them the game plan and we will keep in touch with them along the way so they stay motivated. I can't make them do what they're supposed to do though. And, and flat out, some people are never gonna be able to learn home. Rare, most people have the potential, they just have like, for whatever reason, health issue or something, I can get them back on track. We even coach um, clients on how to get certain things removed from their, their credit as well, so. All right, so let me give you kind of a, these are some do's and don'ts. So these are the things that, um, we, we recommend your clients do and don't do. So we give this to them at the time of pre-approval. Um, but these are just things that you should be aware of. And, and guys, what I don't want you to think you have to do is no lending, no the guidelines, no this, no that. That is not your job, nor should you even try to. It, it, it's, I'll be honest, there's just so many quirks in this and that. And I've had along the way, have realtors try to pre-qualify their clients first and there's you're losing sales at that point because I've, I've had people come to me even though they said well I, I worked up this and I, I think they're only qualified to this I'm like yeah you don't know that you can do this and this and I got them qualified up to here so if you ever get a question which you're going to get a lot of questions about <clears throat> lending stuff whether what are rates now what is this um, I don't know about that all you have to say is you know what that's a great question um, I've got a, a, a great lender that I work with, um, does a great job. I would love to have him give you a call. He would be the one that can break it down for you. You're going to love it. You're going to love it, whatever, right? That's how I, I mean, there's times I get asked questions. I don't know the answer to it. I go, you know what? That's a great question. I have to go look. I have to go ask. I have to go find it, right? So don't be afraid of that. Don't feel like you're 
not a good agent if you don't know those things. You got to come with confidence, and um, the more confidence you bring, the more confidence you exude onto your client, and the more quick, I think, quicker they're going to buy. When, when, you know what I mean? If you're not sure about this market, you're not sure about this. If you're, well, I don't know. Like, you don't want to mislead people, but you do have to have confidence, right? And don't, I'm not suggesting you say anything that's not factual, but you got to just own it, right? And you, like, that's what sales is. You have to build the only one, like, the one word that describes why a client's going to choose each one of you in the room, including me, is I give them confidence that I'm going to take care of them. Everything's going to be, like, they're safe working with me. Another word that kind of goes with that is trust. Until you can get, build that where they trust you like you're you give them so much confidence like you're that realtor real you're the real estate expert that they have the confidence in that's who they're gonna pick right just face it how many realtors do people know the average person knows probably five or six right so all right do's and don'ts then this is a uh, program cheat sheet so the different loan programs i'll just there's kind of got it so the government loans, when I say government loans, the government um, has, uh, they sponsor some loan programs to ensure um, certain ones. It's USDA. So USDA is also known as rural housing. So the, the, that program, you're only eligible if you're buying in a designated eligible area. So typically rural, but it's not like way out rural. It could be parts of Westfield, parts of Noblesville, parts of Greenfield are considered, uh, Brownsburg are considered eligible. So it's not way, way out, but it, it does have to be in a certain area. And then the household income cannot exceed a certain dollar amount. And it depends on how many people are in their family, um, if they have any disabilities in the family, things like that. But um, it's it's pretty high up there. So that that's one program. The FHA is another type of government loan program. Um, and uh, VA for veterans. So if you're a veteran, a VA loan program is great because um, you can put zero money down on this on, on that. And you do have to pay a funding fee, which is an upfront fee with the VA, um, but you don't have to pay the monthly PMI. The monthly mortgage insurance goes away. Now, again, this is, I don't want to keep going too much because it's not the right time to go through loan programs, but the, vet, the VA program, you. Um, if you have a 10% disability with the VA or more, then the VA funding fee will be uh, waived. Um, and then you've got conventional loans. And um, this, so this gives you like a, a, just a cheat sheet of what's required. Um, the other thing I'll mention is condos versus townhomes. Does anybody know the difference? Like these. It's, it's not your question. I mean, when it comes to mortgage, it's like done only at like certain condo residences only allow certain percentages to be. Yeah. So, so unfortunately, uh, the BLC, when you guys put in, I don't know why it's, in real estate, condo and townhome are used interchangeably, right? And they're 100% two different things in the lending world. The difference is a condo, you are not purchasing the land. You're only buying the, the um, structure, right? And with the townhome, you are buying the ground and land with the structure. So when you're not buying the land, there's perceived more risk for a lender to buy a condo because if it burned down, there's nothing left, right? If the townhome burned down, you still have the ground or real estate. So it's just less risk. So with condos being considered to have a little bit more risk, we have to make sure the condo project meets the requirements. So if you're going FHA, it's got to meet the FHA guideline. If it's going conventional, it's got to meet Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Those are the two agencies for conventional lending, right? So what we're looking for is making sure that um, um, the percentage, depends on the loan program that you're going with, but making sure the percentage of people who occupy the home is, is their primary residence. Um, if it's... Um, if there's too many uh, investors or rentals in there, that will bring the values down because private ownership's not quite there, right? A renter's not going to care for the home as well as you would as the owner. And so they only allow usually like 30% rentals. If it exceeds that, then it's not either 
it's not going to be considered um, uh, meeting the, the, the uh, uh, conditions or requirements. We're also making sure HOA dues are all being paid. If there's a delinquent, a number of delinquent HOA payments. That's that's a problem because that's how the pro the management company maintains the property. They're in charge of you know maintaining the roof, the landscape, the sewer, the wall. That well, if people aren't paying their HOA dues in, right? They're gonna run out of money. So we look at that. Are they in litigation? Um, I have one right now. They're the the they're in litigation. Like more than half of the units that the um, um, something I forget what happened, but anyway, they're 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 in a lawsuit. If they lose, they they have to pay like it's like eight hundred thousand dollars or something. And well, that's going to affect their finances, right? So if somebody's in litigation, we have to look at them. what is it, how much is it for, like what are they exposed for, for they have to pay, and do they have um, insurance to to pay for it? If they don't, then that's a problem. So just remember, condos kind of like a red flag. You have to kind of like. You're, you're, you're not going to, it's not possible for us to approve the condo before they go under contract because it takes time. We have to get an appraisal and pay for a condo questionnaire to be completed. But you do want to do a little due diligence, and I do that for you, on whether or not this condo is going to be approved or not. But just remember, condos are, and here's some other proceeds with caution. I'm not going to go through these, but take a look at these. If you got any of these that come up, it just means, hey, why don't you, uh, you know, slow down and ask some questions before you guys, you know, go down that path. All right. I think I'll just wrap up with this. Um, so again, you heard me say this already once. My job is to help you guys make more money, make your life easier, make you look good to your client. We do that a lot, a lot of different ways. So was anybody on the, um, um, did I cover this on the last business meeting? Was anybody okay? Okay, I don't know how much I got into that, but so one way that we help make more money is we um, a lot of our buyers tend to get their offers accepted and when it's competitive because we do a couple of things. When you make when your buyer makes an offer, they you or they or both of you let us know that you're making the offer. I go to the listing agents representing the seller, and I'm basically making sure they know that number one, this is a well-qualified buyer, that's a true statement. Number two, I always verify everything, assets, income, everything. I don't shortcut the process because lenders who pre-approve somebody and later have a problem, it just means they didn't do all the stuff up front. I do that, right? And then I make sure they know I'm local, I'm in Carmel. Um, and the biggest thing that we do is we guarantee our closing dates. So I offer the seller a $2,000 on-time closing date. And so it's like an insurance policy for the seller. So again, I go back to they have two or three final offers that are the same price. How do they pay? It's the lender, right? And on top of that, we're throwing in an insurance policy. Um, Nikki Fever had a, a buyer. She's one of your agents in here. She does a great job. And um, I helped that buyer. The, the, she shared a text message on the Keller Williams uh, Facebook page that she got from the listing agent. The listing agent said, flat out, we had another offer. We went with um, you as a market and the guarantees and the other stuff that we do. So we help you guys win in a competitive market, which helps you guys obviously make money. You're spending less time with that client. Because think about this, if you if you got, would you all agree, you have only a certain amount of capacity or bandwidth, like you can only work with so many clients, right? Before you're just like, full. Oh. If all of those clients are stuck in the process because they can't get their offer accepted, you're maxed out, you cannot go acquire new people. It just doesn't work, right? So now your pipeline is getting stale, which means you're losing money, it's costing you money. So having a good lender, like who's gonna help you guys get your offer accepted and get these people moving through the, the process so you can go get more people is gonna help you get more. Um, there's a lot of stuff from a marketing perspective that we do. That's a whole nother class I could teach is um, most, most people, like we have, probably just need to follow you guys individually or maybe we can send another time, but um, we've got 300 different flyers that you guys have access to that would be co-branded. It has all of your information on it, your picture, whatever you're trying to promote, we have, right? And so instead of you guys having to create stuff on your own or pay somebody to do it, it's, it's, it's free, we do it for you. So think about that. If there's open house or if you're, if anything, um, 
on social you want to do like we have it all okay it is not no so what i'll do is i'll follow up with all of you guys um i'll send you an invite via email for you to opt into our program it'll ask you to upload your your photo and your logo if you have one and then literally you're signed up and then any listing that you guys have so if you're representing a seller once the listing goes live a 25 piece marketing kit gets emailed to you you go on you pick what you want to print there's postcards there's open house flyers there's even a single property uh, website that's created like you can send the link out to people they go to the website they get to see everything it's it's pretty slick you don't do anything right and then on the buy side if there's you know open house stuff there, there's you know other things just let me know what you need and we'll get it to you so it's pretty quick once you guys get signed up but it, it, that could be a really good resource for you guys um, you said you, you guys are natural, so if we have a somebody that's selling this moving out of state, you can help. Yeah, them absolutely. That's a really good point. Yes. So any any sellers moving elsewhere, um, the benefit of that is me being local here. I can meet with them versus them trying to find somebody in that market, and you know they're only usually there for a short period of looking. So a lot of people do appreciate the fact that we are here and helps them just get ready before they go. Yeah. All right. One o'clock. Yeah. It's for lunch. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. So, I, I again, I I'll be a resource for you guys. So there's not stupid questions. My teacher told me that there's never stupid questions. Just stupid people. Um, <laughs> well, I think it's one of my <laughs> no. There, there's never too many questions. Not um, stupid questions. Um, just let me know how I can be a resource for you guys. And if you hear objections, let's talk through them. I can coach you on what to say and do so I can help you guys convert your clients. A lot of it is me having this data that I can share with that client. But yeah, you before deals. Deals. What's that? You say deals. You're starting with somebody else and they're getting in trouble and they can't get financing. and give it. Yeah. Them. We just got, we, I think I mentioned the one. It's closing on the 31st. Yeah. Cool. So, all right. Thank well, you. I'm going to hand it over to the big guy. Thank you. Thank you. Very knowledgeable. More right. the best. Can yes. we give him a five minute break? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Make sure you have the phone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs>